presentation is uh, is free to the public. Uh, uh, and I want to thank the Norfolk, Norfolk uh, Library for hosting it. And, you know, if you if you enjoy this content and all the other wonderful content that uh, the Norfolk Library shares, please consider making a donation to your wonderful local library. Um, thank you. Yeah. Um, so, uh, as Anne pointed out, this is really uh, a, a broad intro to beekeeping. Uh, and this is really uh, uh, the idea here, I'm gonna share my screen while I talk, um, is to uh, get you started down the, the road towards beekeeping and get sort of wet your appetite. But it's not really intended to uh, give you all the tools you're going to need to to get started. Um, so, you know, this is this is a starting place, but it's not. Uh, I wouldn't say you know after after this, go out and start your hive uh, without uh, uh, looking for more resources and, and more education. Um, but you know, uh, I think this is a great follow-up to the uh, um, Queen of the Sun movie that that uh, the Norfolk Library uh, viewed last week. Um, one of the, the, you know, that's a great movie that highlights a lot of the problems in the beekeeping industry. And I think one of the solutions to a lot of those problems is more backyard bees, more, uh, you know, uh, um, more people keeping bees, understanding bees, and understanding the you know the problems that afflict uh, all bees, and and I think of ke keeping honeybees as a great gateway drug to uh, uh, being a naturalist in general. You pay much closer attention to the uh, um, the bloom dates, and, and I you know now I notice other pollinators that I didn't notice before I started. As a, as a beekeeper. Um, so I think it's a great introduction to uh, other ways of being a naturalist. Um, and really mentioned my, uh, you know, did a great job of uh, uh, sharing my uh, intro to beekeeping. Um, I, I started as a Peace Corps volunteer in, in Malawi. I was an agriculture volunteer and I was mostly working on tree nurseries. Uh, uh, but, you know, beekeeping actually emerged as, as something that uh, a lot of the folks in the, the village I was living in, Mazisi in northern Malawi, uh, were really looking for. And we had a few great resources in terms of teachers. Uh, we had some really knowledgeable beekeepers in Mazisi. Well, one is this gentleman here, Buona uh, Mazito, who is a uh, a friend of mine and a local village headman, and he was my first beekeeping mentor, my first teacher. Um, and we worked together to uh, start a beekeepers association, and we taught workshops together in in, uh, in Malawi. And I ended up extending my uh, 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 Peace Corps service for a third year to focus primarily on on that beekeepers association and, and starting a. A honey cooperative with Waza Game Preserve, which is a neighboring game preserve. Um, I came straight back to the States and started working at Stone Barn Center for Food and Agriculture, where I uh, managed the hives there and started teaching beekeeping classes uh, and was asked to teach a beekeeping class in uh, Brooklyn at the rooftop farm, uh, the Brooklyn Grange. Met my beautiful wife, Marlene, pictured here. Uh, on the top right, uh, uh, and we, uh, um, you know, she took my first class at the Brooklyn Grange and uh, ended up uh, uh, marrying the teacher, and <laughs> we we started our farm in 2015 in Falls Village, Connecticut, uh, a beaver tides farm, um, and we've we taught uh, we we tried to continue that that. Uh, teaching of bee, bee classes two years ago in uh, 2019, we had a really wonderful uh, cohort of uh, beekeepers that kept hives on our farm. Uh, and we did a, a, a 10 part uh, beekeeping course throughout the whole season where 
the, the um, students actually kept their own hives on our farm and, and we'd lecture for uh, um, uh, about you know 20 to 30 minutes uh, on a particular topic and then go see those things practically in the hives. Um, and unfortunately last year we had to cancel because of COVID. This year we're gonna change things up a little bit. We're gonna still do it. We're not gonna do inside you know, PowerPoint presentations um, and we're not gonna have people sharing hives. Everybody's gonna have their own hive to maintain social distancing, but we're gonna give it a shot again this year. And lucky enough, we've already sold out. Um, but if you're interested, you know, please uh, you know, go to our, our, our website, uh, beavertidesfarm.com. And, uh, and you can get added to our waiting list for, for the future, or if anybody happens to drop out, um, if you're interested in taking part in that course. Um, so I wanted to start off with a, a question for all of you. Uh, uh, and you know, you're welcome to unmute yourself to answer this question, or you can put the answer in the chat. Um, uh, how much, honey do you think one honeybee produces uh, in the course of her entire lifetime? So in the summer months, a worker bee lives about six weeks long. So in that period of time, in the last three weeks is when she's mostly a forager and collecting nectar and pollen, uh, but the nectar to make honey. So in that three weeks time, and you can put it in the chat box or you can just unmute yourself and shout out the answer. 16 ounces, it's a great guess, but it's much less than that. Um, 16 ounces, you know, that's a pound of honey, uh, much less than a pound. Any other guesses? One pint, uh, less than that. I think, I think a pint's actually about on par with a, a pound of honey, uh, if I'm, I, I, or, about that. Three ounces, even less than three ounces. Okay, now we're in, in the realm uh, of tablespoons. Let's think um, uh, in, the in, in the realm of teaspoons. Uh, and I'll, I'll just go ahead and tell you it's fractions of teaspoons. So less than a teaspoon. What fraction of a teaspoon do you think a honeybee produces in her lifetime? <laughs> One eighth of a teaspoon, yeah, getting closer. <laughs> uh, nope, even, even smaller than one eighth. <laughs> I'll just go ahead and tell everybody, one thirty second. Okay, now we've gone over. <laughs> one twelfth of a teaspoon. So I want you to think about that in, in, in the next time you put a teaspoon of honey in your, uh, in your tea or coffee. That's 12 honeybees' entire lives that went in that one teaspoon of honey. Now, the miracle of this is um, uh, uh, that over the course of a season, uh, honeybees, as working together as a colony, will produce an abundance of 200 pounds in, of honey uh, can in a good year, uh, you know, depending on, you know, drought conditions or, or rainfall and, you know, uh, 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 you know, the basic weather conditions, but uh, they can produce an abundance of 200 pounds of honey uh, in the course of a season. And to me, that's the ultimate uh, uh, example of a community of selfless individuals working together for a greater good for the, uh, uh, for the, for the, the colony or the hive, as it were. Um, so I just, I like to share that fact, uh, and, and there's a lot, you know, the deeper you go into beekeeping, the more you, you learn uh, about, you know, the, the wonder of honeybees and all the amazing, uh, 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 facts about them. Um, it's, you definitely can quickly go down the rabbit hole of, uh, um, uh, going deeper and deeper and uh, uh, falling in love with honeybees. So, um, so generally when I tell people that I'm a beekeeper, uh, they want to know, you know, what do I need to keep my own, uh, my own beehive? 
Um, and I want to go over just the basics of that in this presentation. Um, and with that, you know, what is the right space for your hive? What, you know, you need the right space to keep a hive. You need the right materials, you know, including the hive, the bees, the tools, the, the, the personal protective equipment. And then you need the right skills or knowledge, um, which, you know, that comes much more over time, but I, I wanna give you a little introduction to the right knowledge uh, to get you there. So for the right space here, um, you know, we're, we're blessed with a good mixture, mixture of, uh, um, uh, you know, I say here uh, on our farm in Falls Village at Beaver Tides, uh, we have a great mixture of, um, pollen and nectar sources from our pastures, our, our, you know, our perennial pastures, you know, the clovers and vetch and, and, and Joe pie weed and goldenrod and, and asters that we find in our pastures. But also we're right next to Great Mountain Forest and, and uh, we have a lot of forested land on our, on our property as well. So, um, but any, place you're going to keep bees, you want to make sure you have a good diversity of pollen and nectar sources. Um, uh, so, you know, here right now we have the willows are in full bloom and that's a wonderful source of both pollen and nectar, especially uh, pollen, which is their protein, uh, the, the honeybees protein source. Uh, you know, the, the red maples are starting to bloom now uh, as well. So, you know, having a mixed forest around uh, actually uh, is, is really beneficial. Later in the season when the uh, 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 black locusts and honey locusts, you know, in, in June come into bloom, that's a huge nectar flow for, for us. Uh, as well as uh, not as much here, but you know, when I kept bees closer to the city, when uh, uh, the basswood or, or you know, linden trees would come into bloom, I would see a huge glut of nectar. Um, so you, you end up having quite a, a, a mix of, of nectar and pollen sources. Um, uh, so that's that's important to keep in mind. You also want to make sure that your hives are safe from agrochemicals in general, uh, but pesticides. Um, you know, I ideally would not keep my uh, apiary right across the street from a local golf course, or you know, if unless you know that it's really maintained organically. Um, uh, I would also you know, try and get to know farmers within a three mile radius. And, and you know, obviously you're, they're gonna do what they're gonna do, um, but, you know, try and uh, bribe them with uh, sharing a little bit of honey and get a sense of when they might be uh, uh, spraying their fields with glyphosate in the spring uh, and maybe even tent, uh, you know, I've tented my hives uh, uh, or I've, you know, I've put uh, uh, burlap uh, over my hives, um, or, you know, you can talk to farmers about getting a sense of what the residual time is of, of any pesticides they might be using and really asking them if they can try and spray it in the, in the evening hours, because your, you know, your bees will, uh, travel, uh, three miles in any direction, um, to collect their nectar and pollen. Obviously, if you have more nectar and pollen sources closer to the hive, the better, and, and less likely they are to go farther afield. Um, so that's something to, to bear in mind. Uh, also, safe from bears. Uh, here in northwestern Connecticut, we have plenty of black bears. And you can see in this picture here, uh, behind me, there's these white lines on T-posts. All the hives that I keep are behind some sort of electric fence. Uh, I, you, you know, there are cheap systems out there. Uh, you can just go to Tractor Supply and get T-posts and, and buy poly wire like this and get a, a, a fairly inexpensive plug-in uh, energizer for a fence. Or there are more expensive uh, but higher quality uh, solar uh, fence energizers from companies like Premier One or Ken Cove, 
um, uh, and, and uh, different netting systems that are quick and easy to put up. Um, and you know, if that's not a possibility for you, being able to put electric fence around your hives, I always encourage people to ratchet strap or put truck, truck straps and ratchet their hives together really tightly. So if a bear does come, they're gonna knock it over, but they may it'll have a difficult time getting into it. But I, I, I definitely um, would say it's a safer bet to have an electric fence around any, any beehives in our region. Um, you also have to be cognizant of what, how your, your bees might be affecting your neighbors or you know public walkways. Um, so you, you know I've kept bees in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. You know right across the street from one of the busiest parks in uh, in Brooklyn, uh, and uh, I never had a single complaint, even though people could see the hives uh, because I had all of my entrances above where people were and I had them facing away from the direction where people are. The bee traffic at the entrance is, is generally what you want to keep away from people. Um, even, you know, 30, 40 feet away, uh, they're not going to see any more bees in that spot as long as the entrance isn't facing that way. Um, so, uh, you know, and if, if you need to keep it close to a neighbor and, and it has to face, the entrance has to face in the direction of, of where people might be, um, I always, you know, tell people to put some sort of a barrier, a, a fence that'll make the bees go up as soon as they come out of the hive. Um, but that, that's, that's a good thing to keep in mind. People often ask me if their their hives need shade, and actually, no. Uh, you know, beehives do best in, in full sun. Uh, honeybees do quite well in, in you know in full sun, uh, and varroa mites, their primary uh, uh, parasite or pest, do not do so well in uh, full sun. So I, I uh, often encourage people to um, you know go ahead and have it in a good sunny spot if possible. I wouldn't necessarily put it on a black tarred roof or on, on a black pavement uh, in, in full sun. Uh, uh, you know, if you have to have it in a spot like that, then maybe make sure it gets a little bit of afternoon shade. Um, and the most important thing has to be accessible year round. You really have to be able to get uh, to your hives, uh, otherwise, um, uh, you know, in the winter time, you want to be able to get to your hives and check on them periodically. Uh, and you also want to be, you know, when you're harvesting honey in the summer and fall, you want to make sure that uh, um, you can get, you know, 40 pound honey boxes or, or even 50 pound honey boxes. Uh, away from the hive, or you can carry it back easily. So I like to have my hives in a place that I can get a, a truck or a, a vehicle right up to them. Um, and also, you know, think about places where uh, flooding might be a problem in the in the spring. Um, uh, so well, all all important things to bear in mind. Um, let's see. Oops. Uh, so the right materials, um, you know, the bees themselves are a pretty important material. There's two different ways that you can get your bees. You can get uh, packaged bees, uh, um, uh, which is just the honeybees themselves with a queen in the cage uh, in the center of that cluster that you see in the picture at the bottom here. Um, that, that's, that's the way most bees that are shipped up from the south come. It's usually a cheaper way to get your bees. And it also is, uh, um, tends to be a little bit of a safer bet in terms of disease, uh, uh, because there's no uh, brood that can harbor certain brood diseases. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it's a little rough on the bees in, in transit and, you know, you can even see in this picture, there's a few dead bees on the bottom of the box there. 
Um, so it's certainly not uh, uh, the gentlest way uh, to, to buy bees, um, but it's, it's a good way to get started. Um, and you can actually treat your bees with oxalic acid, which is a, an a organic acid that's a, um, very benign for the bees. It really has very little effect on them that I've ever seen. Um, and that, that helps knock off any residual varroa mites that might be on them from the previous uh, location. Um, uh, uh, another option for getting bees is a nuke. I'm sure that I'm being tracked by the NSA because I'm constantly sending texts and making phone calls looking for or, or trying to sell nukes, <laughs> but it has nothing to do with nuclear uh, devices. <laughs> it's uh, a, a nucleus colony, which is, ba you know, it's, the, it's the, the essentials of a colony, including uh, usually five frames uh, that have uh, the bees and have a laying queen and already has uh, hatching brood. Brood being, uh, you know, the, the, the eggs that the queen lays that'll hatch out into larvae, those larvae will pupate, um, and then will hatch out into adult bees. You're, when you buy a nuke, you should have in that five frame box, uh, eggs, larvae, and pupa, um, so right away you have brand new bees being hatched out. It's a very gentle way uh, uh, to, to start a colony. Um, uh, all you're doing is transferring those five frame nukes uh, from the, the box that you, you get from the beekeeper and putting them in a larger uh, hive that they now the colony can grow. And, and it's a much faster way to get started. It's also generally more expensive uh, to get started. Uh, generally, nukes are going to be uh, $200 to $250. Um, packages uh, will be anywhere from $125 to $160, uh, depending on where they're coming from. So now you have the bees, you need a hive. Um, there's different options for, for hives. But I'm going to focus on the Langstroth hive, which is the primary way we keep bees in North America and that I've had the most success with in, uh, in, in, in the Northeast. Um, I've also kept top bar hives and uh, I've had less success overwintering top bar hives as I have with uh, Langstroth hive, which is it's named after uh, the Reverend uh, Lorenzo Langstroth of Philadelphia, who uh, discovered bee space. Uh, it's actually the amount of space that uh, uh, bees in a natural hive uh, keep between their combs, which is three eighths of an inch. So he, he came up with these boxes and they have frames, wooden frames that are in, inside that. Um, and the, each frame has shoulders on it uh, that maintain that three eighths of an inch space between the combs. So, you know, he came up with the first uh, removable frame uh, high or removable comb hive. Uh, before that, people generally kept skeps, uh, you know, like the, the basket hive that looks like a dome, and, you know, you see in Winnie the Pooh. Uh, <laughs> the um, uh, uh, the when Lorenzo Langstroth discovered bee space, Dayton and Sons, uh, 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 you know some of the the uh, original beekeeping suppliers in our in, our, in in North America came up with this Langstroth hive. And other people in other countries sometimes people call it a Dayton hive. Um, uh, so. You have a bottom, a bottom board, uh, which is essential. You can also have a hive stand underneath it. Um, the bottom board is where the entrance is, where the bees come in and out. Generally, I'll have some sort of an entrance reducer here, which you can see there's a, a little uh, sort of wooden shim in the front of this illustration. Um, I like to be able to change 
the, the, the size of the entrance depending on the time of year. When the bees are weaker, have a smaller entrance. When the bees are very strong, have a larger entrance. entrance. But when scare, uh, resources get scarce in the late summer, early fall, and uh, um, yellow jackets and, and other pests and other bees are, are looking to rob uh, out your hive, you can reduce the entrance again. Um, every, I, I recommend starting with two deep boxes like you see on the bottom here. A deep super or a deep box uh, is generally the brood nest. That's where the queen is gonna lay her eggs and she's gonna um, uh, get the hive going. Uh, uh, that, that's where you know the the all the uh, reproduction happens generally, and she wants to have longer frames uh, to lay a big clutch of eggs uh, uh, together. That and usually they will want to keep that closer to the entrance, anyways, because uh, uh, for being able to ventilate the brood, you know, they have to maintain 92 degrees consistently in the hive throughout the whole summer. And when it's in full sun, uh, they actually really need to, to fan the brood to keep it cool enough. So uh, having it as close to an entrance as possible is beneficial. And they also usually will keep their honey up above, farther away from the entrance to keep it farther away from any potential pests or robbers. Um, a lot of beekeepers use a queen excluder uh, it's, a, it's a screen that the queen can't fit her abdomen through, uh, and this keeps the brood down below and all the honey production up above. I recommend people potentially start without a queen excluder. Uh, you can have it on hand, uh, but it's difficult. The, the bees have a difficult time drawing out the original comb, making beeswax above a queen excluder. Um, so until all the comb is built, uh, I usually don't recommend. So, you know, I recommend starting to use a queen excluder, excluder in year two, potentially. Um, and in year one, you can just cherry pick your honey frames instead of trying to harvest a whole box of honey at the top. So uh, the, I, uh, so the, we have the deep, deep boxes or deep supers, and then we have shallow or medium boxes, which are generally used for honey. The reason why it's a smaller box is it's lighter. Honey is very heavy. You know, when uh, uh, if a deep box uh, uh, is full of honey, that's going to be uh, close to 80 pounds. Uh, if every every all 10 frames are um, uh, um, are, are full of honey, that's going to be about 80 pounds. Um, so a, a medium box would be closer to 45 pounds if all of that is full. So that's, that's the benefit of having your honey supers be smaller. And then on top of that, you need an inner cover to, to help uh, prevent the bees from gluing down your outer cover. Uh, the outer cover is the weather protection. The inner cover is just to uh, a little spacer to keep uh, uh, the outer cover from getting glued down. Uh, it also helps create ventilation at the top of the hive as well. Um, there's two different types of uh, uh, Langstroth hives that you can choose from, eight frame hives or 10 frame hives. Just, uh, it's exactly what it, it sounds like. Um, an eight frame hive is gonna be lighter. So that's the benefit of an eight frame hive. A 10 frame hive, you get a little more wiggle room uh, before you need to uh, uh, add more boxes uh, because the bees have more space to grow the colony in each, each box. Um, so uh, I generally run 10 frame hives, but that's only because uh, that's what I'm used to and I'm kind of old school in that sense. Most people that I know getting started nowadays you buy, uh, opt for an eight frame hive because it's much better on your back. Um, uh, so that's, that's our materials in terms of hive and bees. We also need tools. Uh, one of the most essential 
tools is a hive tool and there's two styles. There's a regular, um, uh, uh, it's like the standard hive tool. It looks like a paint scraper. Uh, you can see in the top right corner and right next to it, you see a J hook hive tool. I recommend getting both, you know, all the beekeeping supply places will carry both. Um, they are generally, uh, you know, six uh, to $10 a piece. Uh, so it's well worth getting both, seeing which one works best for you. Um, every beekeeper needs some way to feed sugar syrup because there are gonna be times where you need to supplement feed uh, for your bees. You wanna minimize that as much as possible, but especially when you first install your bees, they're, uh, you know, in a late April, early May, they're not gonna be able to uh, uh, quickly identify all the local nectar sources or, or you know, it'll take a little while to, for them to start bringing in nectar. So you wanna get them settled in by feeding uh, a simple syrup, uh, a sugar uh, sugar syrup, mixing uh, uh, white sugar, uh, one part white sugar to one part water by volume, um, and that's that's a, a way to get them started. Obviously, once you put your honey supers on, you're not going to be feeding any sugar syrup. So this one here on the left is a uh, uh, an in hive frame feeder. You take two frames out temporarily put that in and it's it's a nice secure way to um, have it have a feeder inside the hive um, it, it's also is if you're feeding in the early spring or in the late fall it's kept warm by the bees uh, cluster warmth um, so that's ideal uh, uh, I, and that's mostly what I use is frame feeders like the one you see on the left the one on the right is a hive top feeder uh, these are also very good and you know they're really good for feeding out a glut of, of uh, sugar syrup when you need it um, which induces the bees to um, uh, uh, make use of you know especially for feeding in the fall uh, they'll they'll make uh, stores for the winter because uh, you know sometimes like this last year we experienced a pretty heavy drought uh, up until the fall um, so a lot of bees were very short on natural honey and a lot of beekeepers had to feed out a glut of sugar syrup just so the bees would have enough honey to get through the winter time. Um, entrance reducer I talked about already. This is a picture of one here. I really think that's essential for keeping down uh, pests from getting in the hive and also from uh, uh, avoiding the spread of disease from hive to hive. Varroa mites will oftentimes come in on robber bees or uh, they, you know, you're also protect, protecting your neighbor's bees. If your hive has a heavy infestation of uh, varroa mites and your neighbor might uh, uh, have a healthy colony that doesn't have mites, well, now they're gonna come and rob out your, your hive before it crashes and uh, if you don't have an entrance reducer, um, they're likely to spread the mites to their hives. Um, a bee brush is also uh, really essential for being able to just gently remove bees from a frame of honey when you're bringing in for, for the honey harvest time. Um, <clears throat> along with right materials, personal protective equipment, that I think the most important tool in terms of personal protective equipment is a, a smoker. Um, if, you know, I know plenty of people that go into their hives without a veil, without a suit, without gloves, but uh, I, I, don't, I don't think it's wise to go into your hives without um, a smoker. The, the smoker acts as um, a mask for uh, the, the alarm pheromone that the, the, the bees release in the hive. Uh, so anytime you disturb the hive, even if you just pop the entrance or pop the lid off the top, the vibrations are going to cause the bees to release that alarm pheromone. It's a sweet smell, similar to bananas, actually. Um, uh, so I always like to give a puff of smoke, but even before I touch the hive, it, to me, it's also like my way of knocking at the hive. I use the same smoker fuel. I use 
white pine needles uh, uh, that are dried out that I just collect, you know, during the dry part of the summer. Um, and, or some people use baling twine. It doesn't matter what you use for smoker fuel, you want to use a consistent smell. So it's almost like you're knocking uh, uh, and asking for entrance before you go into the hive. They'll know, you know, if they have a similar smell every time you go in the hive and you're, you're um, working your hive gently and efficiently, um, and I think over time you get gentle, um, gentler bees. Um, so I highly recommend uh, smoker. Um, uh, suit and veil, I highly recommend to begin with. You want to be comfortable working your hives. So I, I recommend getting the full regalia, you know, get, get a veil. Um, you know, if, you, if you're looking for a cheaper option, just get a, a veil and have a heavy canvas shirt and heavy, you know, nice uh, heavy jeans uh, that will protect you. Um, but uh, um, you want to make sure that you're able to seal all the gaps. That's a nice thing about buying a professional bee suit. You can also buy ventilated suits that have uh, um, like air pockets on the sides. Um, that's ideal. That way you're um, able to uh, um, feel comfortable when you're working the hives. Um, I also recommend starting off with beekeeping gloves that have elastic bands at the elbows. Uh, that, that way you're going to feel the most comfortable. If you're nervous, the bees get nervous, just like any livestock. You want to you wanna maintain your composure as much as possible and they'll, they'll reciprocate it. Um, also boots are really great uh, uh, for preventing that incredibly uncomfortable feeling of a bee crawling up your pant leg, which I've experienced many a time. So that's, it's ideal to have boots and maybe uh, a bee suit that you can, uh, has elastic bands at, at, the, at the bottoms of the legs as well. Um, that's our son Oliver there. Um, Okay, so we've covered the right materials. We got, um, you know, uh, the, 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 the bees themselves, the hives, uh, uh, the, the tools and the personal protective equipment. The last element is the right knowledge. And I think the best thing you can do is find a mentor. Um, you know, I've already mentioned our beekeeping class. Um, and it, it is full for this year, but there are similar other uh, classes in the area. And I really recommend trying to find a beekeepers association. Um, here in Northwestern Connecticut, we don't have a great, uh, 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 we don't have a nearby local bee, beekeepers association that I know of, maybe one of you knows of one. Um, the, I'm a member of the Backyard Beekeepers Association that meets in Western Connecticut. And it's the last Tuesday of every month, if I'm remembering right. Um, uh, uh, I might have that. Uh, might have that backwards. Might be the first Tuesday. Of every, I didn't know. I'm pretty sure it's the last Tuesday of every month. Uh, and we're currently meeting on Zoom. Uh, uh, we're doing remote meetings. Definitely check out uh, Backyard Beekeepers Association of Connecticut. Also, the Connecticut Beekeepers Association has a. Uh, roaming uh, 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 meeting. Uh, so it's a quarterly meeting and they meet at a different site throughout the year. And usually one of those sites, usually in the fall is in Bethlehem, which is fairly close. Um, so that's uh, one option. I know the Northern Berkshire County has a beekeepers association. Also the Catskill Mountain Beekeepers Association meets at a uh, Hudson Valley Beekeepers, uh, Hudson Valley Beekeeper, Beekeeping Supply Company, um, uh, and that's a great beekeepers association. But you you know, want to do it whatever you can to to find a mentor. Have you know be able to take a picture and send it to somebody. And, and you know you want to be able to if you can find a mentor, see if you can tag along and get your hands in a hive and actually see somebody working a hive. That's the best way to really start to feel comfortable yourself. Um, so uh, I think that's the best way to, to, to build your knowledge, but I wanna sort of give you a basic primer here of what you're gonna find in the hive uh, uh, when you keep bees. Um, there's 
These are all the elements in the hive, in, in a beehive, are bees, the bees wax, which the bees produce themselves, uh, you know, from their own, their own wax glands on their body. Uh, the brood, which is the eggs that hatch out in the larvae and that uh, go through the metamorphosis of becoming pupa. That's what this, these silky cappings you see here are pupated bees, and that's when the metamorphosis happens into adult bees. And then you're also going to find uh, in that comb uh, nectar, uh, which is uh, the, the carbohydrate for bees. Uh, uh, it's their energy source. And they want to preserve that for the you know, times when there are not nectar flows. You know, here in the Northeast, uh, namely the winter time. Uh, and so that's why they uh, add uh, 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 um, invertase or, and other digestive enzymes to the nectar to break down those complex sugars into simpler sugars to make honey, which is naturally um, uh, 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 preserved and antimicrobial and uh, it, it will never go bad so long as it's sealed. Um, you can see uh, that there's these wax cappings at the top of the hive that's honey, that's their, their stores for the winter. It's basically when they cap their honey, that's their jarring or, or you know, laying away cans for the winter, essentially. Um, uh, so that's their nectar source. Their protein source is pollen. That's what you see in this bottom picture here, these beautiful different colors. Um, that's, that's, that's what I get for having a farm across the street from uh, Great Mountain Forest, we get such a variety in our pollen sources. You see this beautiful crimson red to um, some of the uh, uh, like real beautiful blues in there. Um, so uh, that's everything in the hive. Let's go through those one at a time though. Um, so the bees, there's three casts of bees in the hive. The majority of the bees in the hive uh, are worker bees, which in this picture that has three bees here side by side, the far left is uh, a, a worker bee. She's an infertile female and she makes up about 95% of the hive. Uh, they do every, every major job in the hive from uh, being nurse bees that, that, that feed the, the, the uh, larvae uh, to being cleaning bees that clean up the comb after, after uh, uh, pupa hatch out uh, to eventually being guard bees. When they develop their sting at two weeks old, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll be the, the guards at the entrance. Being queen attendants, which you can see in this picture on the left, all those uh, worker bees surrounding the queen are feeding her. They're touching her with their antennae, uh, picking up her pheromones to tell everybody uh, else in the hive, that everything's copacetic by passing on her smell. Um, uh, they will, they are the builders of the hive. They have wax glands on their abdomen and they will build the beeswax, which I'll show you in another slide in a minute. Um, they eventually become the foragers. Uh, when they get old enough, they start to leave the hive and go and collect nectar and pollen uh, from a three mile radius. Um, so they do everything in the hive. And then next to them in the middle here, you have the lowly drone, <laughs> drone, uh, uh, the male bees in the hive, which make up uh, um, uh, less than 5% of the hive in the season. And then once resources get scarce in the fall, they get kicked out and they starve to death because they can't uh, 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 really protect themselves or you know, they, they, they have no way of providing for themselves. Um, their primary purpose in the hive is to pass on the genetics of the hive. When they reach a certain age, any of you that saw the movie Queen of the Sun got to see uh, uh, drone congregation areas. Uh, when, when, when drones get old enough, they start to leave the hive and they go out to drone congregation areas. It's basically a cloud of drones, a mixture of drones that are mixing together from different hives. And when a, a new virgin queen emerges from any hive in a three mile radius, they're going to find that drone congregation area 
and I'm going to fly through it, and the fastest and the strongest of the drones will mate with her. Um, uh, his uh, penis is barbed like a worker bee's stinger is barbed, so it'll rip away, uh, uh, killing him. Uh, he's fulfilled his one purpose in life, but he's the, the purpose of that is it's sealing off his genetics uh, and making sure that um, uh, that his colony's genetics is passed on to that queen. Um, and, and a queen will get, early in her life, will get mated by up to 20 or 30 different drones on her nuptial flights early on, and then she's done. Uh, she doesn't need to go on another nuptial flight for the rest of her life. Uh, she has all that sperm in her spermatheca gland, uh, in her abdomen, uh, and she has two separate oviducts, one that goes through the spermatheca gland and will uh, become a fertilized egg that will produce a worker bee. Or she has another oviduct that goes straight out to her ovipositor or, or uh, you know, uh, that she can lay straight away without fertilizing it. That's a haploid egg that will become a drone. So she has a capacity to decide whether she's laying a male or a female. A drone would be a direct descendant of the queen, uh, uh, essentially a clone of the queen genetically. Um, uh, so, uh, um, but she she decides whether she's laying a haploid or diploid egg based on the size of the hexagon. A queen has six legs, so when she's going around laying eggs in the hive, uh, uh, she's going to put one of those. Uh, six feet uh, in each corner and size up the, that cell. If it's a larger cell the, that the workers built, then you know uh, she knows they need more drones, so she'll lay a haploid egg. If it's a smaller cell, uh, then she's going to lay a diploid egg, a worker, or it could eventually even become a queen. The way a worker becomes a queen is right from when it hatches out as an egg, that cell is drawn out, the wax is drawn out and pointed down. Uh, that's a, a, a what we call a queen cell. It looks like a little peanut, but uh, that's hanging off of the frame. But all the other cells are going horizontally. That's a sign that it should be a worker. But when they point it downwards vertically, um, that's a sign this is gonna potentially be a queen. So all the workers just feed royal jelly. Uh, they, don't, they don't feed uh, uh, pollen and nectar to that larvae. They feed royal jelly. That's what develops her ovaries and makes the queen different. Um, there's only going to be one queen in every hive, except when you know the hive gets overcrowded and they are ready to swarm, which I'll talk about in a minute. They'll make new queens uh, and uh, the old queen will take off. Um, and so sometimes there may be two or three queens there at the same time, but if those queens ever find each other, it's mortal combat. They'll, they'll fight to the death. Um, so the, the, it becomes very Game of Thrones in, in, a, in a honeybee colony. I'll just give you a basic anatomy of a worker bee. The main thing I want you to take away from this is that we think of bees in three segments. The head, where the antennae, the eyes, the uh, 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 mandibles, and the, um, uh, um, the proboscis, their, their straw-like tongue, uh, are all attached to the head. Uh, then they have their thorax. This is the muscle segment. Uh, that's where the wings are attached and all six legs are attached on both a worker bee or a queen bee. If you're ever handling any bee, you wanna be touching just the thorax. That's the muscle segment. There's no organs in the, the thorax. And then the abdomen is the very sensitive part of a bee. And it's also where the stinger happens to be. So, you know, if you're handling a worker bee for sure, you don't wanna to touch the abdomen but also a queen, her ovaries are there and you can do serious damage to a queen by uh, uh, you know, even just gently touching the, the, the abdomen. So you know, I've, I, I generally will only pick up a bee by her uh, thorax um, and try and keep my hands away from her stinger. Um, in her abdomen though, she has 
uh, the crop, which is when they collect nectar, they, they, they suck it through their proboscis and it goes into the, uh, the crop, that, uh, that, that, that holding spot in her stomach that adds the digestive enzymes to it. And then she regurgitates that nectar and that starts the, the conversion into uh, um, uh, honey. Um, then she'll pack it into a cell and they dehydrate it by fanning it with their wings. Uh, even their heart is a dorsal heart. You know, everything is in the abdomen. Um, uh, Give myself a quick time check. Oops. Sorry, I don't have a clock on here. Um, please uh, let me know if I'm getting a little close in the chat. Uh, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so what else is in the hives? The bee wax, the beeswax is uh, um, uh, 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 made by the bees, as I said. You can see in this picture, uh, um, the, the worker bee pushing out, uh, um, thanks for the time check, 625. I'll, I'll I'm getting close to the end here. Uh, uh, so there's eight wax glands on the abdomen of every worker bee. Um, and uh, she will uh, um, uh, pass those wax, those wax flakes up to her mandibles and chew it up and make this perfectly hexagonal comb that you see up above. Um, and they, what they're doing here is they're hanging off of each other. This is called festooning. They're actually uh, using gravity to draw out their comb um, and make that perfect hexagonal comb. Uh, the brood, as I said, the, uh, a, a queen is going to lay an egg. It'll hatch out after three days into a teeny tiny larvae. It'll go from a, a larvae that you can almost you can barely even see to uh, uh, filling the whole cell. Um, so the, in five to six days, that larva, larval period is the growth period. And then she will pupate uh, and she has, the larvae has uh, uh, silk glands in her mouth parts and the worker bees will help to make a pupa. And that's when the metamorphosis happens. And then after 21 days, an adult bee is gonna emerge. Um, so those are the, that's a broad overview, <laughs> and I'm sorry, I kind of rushed through it at the end there because uh, I was going a little long, um, but I wanted to leave you with one final thought, uh, uh, and that's when honeybees swarm. I don't know how many of you have ever seen a swarm of bees before, uh, but uh, it, it did, when the hive gets overcrowded, uh, they will make a new queen. And before that new queen emerges, the adults, uh, 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 the, the old queen will take off with about 40% of the hive. The oldest uh, uh, bees in the hive will go with her and they'll cluster in a tree. And what they're gonna do while they're clustered there, they're protecting the queen, they're sending out scouts looking for a new place to live. Um, and so if they find the right size cavity in an oak tree on the, you know, two and a half miles away, that scout will come back and do a waggle dance on top of that cluster of bees or that bivouac of bees. Um, the angle in which she's doing her waggle phase is the same angle in, in relation to straight up and down vertical. That's the angle from uh, the bivouac to the new uh, uh, um, site um, uh, where they want to make a hive. Sorry, my five-year-old's going to join us for the end. Uh, and that new site is, uh, 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 well, they, 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 she'll come back and do that waggle dance and the, the other scouts will go and check out that site. If they like it, they're going to do the same waggle dance. Um, if they find another site they like better, they're going to do a different waggle dance. So essentially what they're doing when they're swarming is they're voting. And they won't break from that cluster until they're all doing the exact same waggle dance. Uh, um, and uh, once they, 
once they are in total agreement, they will break cluster and they will all fly away together. Um, and you know, they're, they're able to uh, follow directions up to three miles away just from that waggle dance. And uh, you know, I have to give credit to Dr. Tom Seeley. He wrote a beautiful book about this uh, swarming behavior called Honeybee Democracy. Um, so one more uh, uh, thing to sort of whet your appetite for the beauty of bees um, and, and, and you know, try and get you excited about keeping your own hives. Um, I, uh, you know, just wanted to mention again, uh, our beekeeping class for this year is going to be, is, is sold out temporary, is sold out uh, at the moment. But if, uh, if people are interested, uh, we are going to do some one-off classes and things like that. We're going to do a honey harvest festival in the fall. Um, so please check out our website uh, and, and have a look to see if you want to participate in any of those. Um, so I, first question I see here, uh, uh, do you ever use flow through hives? I think that you're talking about the flow hive, which comes from Australia. I have, I helped uh, 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 a friend of mine keep his flow hive. I helped him get started with it. Um, and it was pretty incredible. Uh, the a flow hive is basically uh, a comb that ha uh, has a device embedded in it so that you can break, uh, uh, um, you can actually uh, break the cells without pulling frames out and honey drains out through a tube and, and you never have to pull frames out to harvest them. Uh, and it, I can attest, it actually really does work. The drawbacks are two things. One, uh, you, the queen can't get into those cells because, uh, you know, once she starts uh, laying eggs in there, you know, you're going to have mushed larvae mixed in with your honey if, uh, if the queen ever is on those frames. But, you know, you can use a queen excluder to keep her from, from getting there. Um, the other thing is, you know, the, the, when the flow hive first came out, it was really marketed as you don't ever need to disturb your bees. And to me, that worries me a little bit. I think people don't manage their bees enough. They don't uh, have a sense of whether they have a, a laying queen. Uh, they, you know, you need to actually get into your hives and see if you have pests like varroa mites or small hive beetles or all sorts of, you know, di different diseases or pests or, or um, pathogens. Um, and the only way you can do that is by actually going into your hives. So I, I, I'm a little hesitant about the flow hive, but it is a really well-designed uh, um, device. And I think if you go into it knowing you still need to manage your hives can be really a beautiful thing. Another question that came up earlier that I missed was how do bees know about hexagons? Boy, you know, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> that, that's a great question. That's something I need to look more into. Um, but I, I think, you know, that's, uh, uh, I, you know, the bees have been keeping their, their comb in hexagons to maximize space, uh, you know, for millennia. Um, um, you know, um, cave paintings of, of uh, uh, you know, honey hunters and people that harvested honey from wild hives had hexagons in them. So I know it's long been the case. And I think the reason why is because that's the, the perfect way to maximize the space is using a hexagon. I don't know how they came to that though. It's a wonderful question and goes beyond my knowledge. Um, any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, please. If that's all right. Um, so we're in Colebrook and we got some equipment to start. We were emailing about uh, doing the class in 19 with your wife, I think. Um, but then we got cold feet because we have a lot of bearers. And a friend told us that an electric fence wouldn't, wouldn't be effective. Um, you seem to find it successful. So yeah, the key is making sure it is very hot right from the beginning um and you know having a, a fence and having a fence tester you know you, if you uh, premier one which I'll, I'll go ahead and just write in the tight in, in the chat so that you have the 
Premier one is a, a great uh, 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 source for um, fence equipment and the fence testers. Um, boy, I hope I'm spelling it right. <laughs> Premier one uh, or Ken Cove. Um, uh, Ken Cove, yep, are both really good. Uh, um, I think I just, did it pop up in the chat? No, oh, I think I just sent, I need to send it to everybody. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, those are good, good sources. I misspelled Premier, <laughs> that was a typo, but you get it. Premier yeah. One and Ken Cove. And, and you can buy a fence tester and as long as it's good and hot, and I always, when I first set up hives and, be, and, and the bare fences, I always hang bacon on the, the uh, fence because you, you, your area is most likely gonna be patrolled by the same bear. So you want when that bear comes that it gets a good shock right on the muzzle um, and it'll it'll respect it from then on. Um, okay. I've, you know, I have bears that come through my farm all the time, uh, I, and I've never had them get into my hives. And now I actually only have two strands. You know, I've reconfigured it. I originally had uh, five strands of electric up, but that. Um, you know, I've reconfigured it now and I'm, I've been just fine with two, but I, I recommend starting with uh, a good bear fence. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> um, for those of you that are interested in having our own bees, uh, but more long-term in the future, what are some short-term ways we can promote bee health in our communities? Great question. I think planting flowers is, uh, is, is key. Um, you know, having a diversity of flowers throughout the, the year uh, that are, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, blooming from early spring to late fall, and especially in those gaps in the, in the winter time uh, when uh, there's, there's not, as many nectar, I'm sorry, not in the winter time, in the, in the midsummer when there's not as many nectar and pollen sources like July, August. Um, you know, using cover crops in your garden uh, like buckwheat or uh, Dutch white clover, um, you know, it, plant that in your, your walkways and, and don't, you know, don't mow your dandelions every week. <laughs> you know, a little bit less mowing is a good thing for not only honeybees, but our natural bees too, and our other pollinators. You know, if you can leave some wild spaces where there is uh, um, uh, 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 you know, where there's uh, uh, milkweed and goldenrod and things like that, the better for sure. Um, any other questions? I apologize for going over a little well, that's bit. That's fine, Dan. This is Kelly from the library. So if anyone else wants to unmute and ask a question, now would be a great time. And if there are no more questions um, and you think of one later, you can always feel free to email us at the library and we'll make sure that Dan gets your question and we'll get your answer. And I, on the, oh, yes, yeah, someone, go ahead. I heard someone out there. Isn't buckwheat a very strong flavor and wouldn't that taint the honey that comes out of the hive? Uh, yeah, it is a very strong flavor. Um, I actually love buckwheat honey. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I, I think when it's mixed in a wildflower honey, it actually does quite well. It, it balances out some of the sweeter nectar sources like clover and, and dandelion. Um, but uh, it, it, when it's when it's pure buckwheat, it is very strong. It's you know, and it has almost like a skunky uh, flavor to it. My other favorite nectar source is uh, is goldenrod, which is also very strong, dark, ambery honey like buckwheat. Um, so yeah, it's really it's up to the to the person. Um, uh, buckwheat can bloom throughout the season, though, so it's not like goldenrod where you know. 
if you put on a honey super in late August and uh, harvest it in, in you know, September or October, it's most likely going to be goldenrod or aster honey. Um, uh, with buckwheat, you know, it can bloom throughout the growing season and it, it does make a great, it is, it is, it is high in antibodies and it's a very healthful uh, nectar source, both for you the bees and us. You mentioned mites as being a problem with bees, uh, killing off bees. Is there a way to, uh, is there a prophylactic or is there a way to prevent mites in your hives? Mm. Yeah, there's a number of different prophylactics. Um, and, but, you know, uh, there, there, there's long been uh, uh, miticides that beekeepers have used. And, you know, just like any pesticide, we're kind of on the, 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 the cycle of, uh, you know, introducing a miticide and the mites becoming resistant to that miticide. Um, the most recent one that most bee, you know, commercial beekeepers use now is Amitraz. It's, uh, it's actually, uh, uh, pe beekeepers used to use Amitraz off-label. Uh, it was tactic, you know, a tick treatment or uh, a mite and tick treatment for, for sheep uh, and, and cattle. But um, now there is a commercial product that, that's approved for beekeepers that um, people use. Um, but the, the bees are finding resistance, or the mites are finding resistance to that. And the downside of a lot of these uh, pesticides in the hive is that they, you know, they build up in the beeswax over time. So is so is uh, uh, um, the uh, uh, well the, the the beeswax is a lipid, so you know it builds up in the beeswax and it'll synergize oftentimes with other uh, uh, miticides um, or, or other agrochemicals in the area and make more dangerous compounds. I prefer using organic acids. Uh, I don't use them really prophylactically. Uh, I use them, I actually sample my bees uh, uh, periodically. I'll, I'll actually take uh, a half a cup of bees. You can, uh, and that's one of the things we teach in our classes is how to do this. Um, but you can, you can capture some young nurse bees that can't fly or sting yet, um, cover them in powdered sugar and, and, and that knocks the mites off of their bodies. So half a cup of bees is roughly about 300 bees. Um, so you get a decent sample. And this, this was a, a method come up with, uh, come up by uh, Marla Spivak at the University of Minnesota. Um, and it's commonly used. You can also, you, you can kill those bees and get a more uh, accurate count uh, using alcohol, um, ethyl alcohol. Um, you know, you lose 200 bees, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, 300 bees, but you're also, um, you know, you're getting a very accurate count on how many mites you have for those 300 bees. Uh, then, uh, you know, you have to develop your own threshold. Uh, how many mites are you comfortable having per 300 bees in your hive? Um, I use formic acid, which doesn't leave any residue in the hive. Um, it's very harsh on the queens. I use that in extreme circumstances. And I use oxalic acid, which is basically wood bleach um, in a low concentration sometimes. And neither, both formic acid and oxalic acid are naturally occurring in honey. Um, and they, they do not leave any residue in the hive. Um, but, you know, I had really heavy losses this winter. I had my heaviest losses ever. And I think a part of that is the viruses that the mites are carrying are getting stronger. Um, I think we need to develop as a beekeeping industry, more mite resistant lines of bees. Uh, we need our, our, our you know, USDA ARS to really invest in, uh, in, in um, researching more ways to fight varroa mites. Um, I think we're going to find after this winter, we're going to have some of the heaviest uh, national losses that we've had in a long time. Just hearing through the grapevine, talking to some of my commercial beekeeper friends out west, um, 
It's, it's been a really bad one. Um, what type of bees do I use? I, I, I use a mix of different bees. So there's different uh, uh, lines of bees that um, are different races of bees or, or um, uh, subspecies of bees that uh, most beekeepers in the United States keep Italian honeybees. They're good honey producers. They are fairly, very gentle. They're known to be gentle and they build up very fast in the spring. Um, uh, there's on the other end of the spectrum is Russian bees that a lot of people like. Uh, people don't like Italians because they're not as hardy and they're not as mite resistant. Russian bees, on the other hand, are, um, are very uh, mite resistant. They're um, very hardy bees. They do well in the winter, but they're not as good of honey producers. <laughs> so I, I have a, 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 in the past kept Russians and I've also kept carniolans. Carniolans uh, come from the Swiss Alps. Uh, they're kind of a in between uh, between the two. They're not as good of honey producers as Italians, but they tend to be more mite resistant and more hardy. Um, not quite as hardy or mite resistant as Russians. Russians also tend to be uh, some of the most defensive bees. So that's why I've moved away from Russians and more towards carniolans recently. There's a, a line of bees that I um, bought a couple queens from uh, Oliveras out in California. Uh, called the Saskatraz. Uh, it, it's bred in Saskatchewan, Canada. It's supposed to be a more winter hardy line, and all those died this winter. So <laughs> those I wasn't wasn't as like I, that. It was one of the colonies, or, or I had I had two Saskatraz hives this past year, and neither of them made it through this winter. So, uh, so much for a hardy line of bee, uh, winter hardy line of bees. Um, I think the more we can find local sources uh, for for queens and lines of bees, the better. Um, you know, uh, Sam Comfort is a guy here in uh, near nearby in Claverack, New York. He raises. Uh, um, uh, different lines of bees. He, he has a more natural approach to treating varroa and, and trying to breed in resistance to varroa mites. And, and both resistance as well as uh, resistance, meaning the bees will actually um, uh, 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 attack the mites themselves. They'll bite at the mites or, you know, there's all, actually a line of bees called an the ankle biters. They actually bite the legs off of the, the mites. Um, so, you know, there's resistant lines of bees and there's also tolerant lines of bees. They can just deal with the diseases better. Um, so we can always look for those more resistant and tolerant bees out there. Um, lots of really good questions. I appreciate it. Is there any other burning questions out there? Well, thank you again to the Norfolk Library. I really appreciate uh, uh, you giving me the time to talk about more bees and, uh, and uh, hopefully this encourages some of you guys to start your own hives. And, uh, you know, please feel free to reach out anytime. Uh, and, you know, I hope to connect with you all at Beaver Tides uh, in the future. Please take the time to check out our website if you can. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Dan, and thanks everyone for joining. Um, just a quick note that if you're not subscribed to the library's newsletter, please do so because as Dan was saying, having flowers, having diversity of flowers is going to really help bees in our community. So the Norfolk Library is going to start offering seeds later on in the spring. So you can come and pick up springs, and, or springs, you can come and pick up seeds and sprinkle them about. And so just watch the night owl for that. And we also have a few great books on beekeeping in our collection. And if there's ever a book on beekeeping that you're interested in that we don't have, let us know and we will look into purchasing that. So thank you everyone and have a good night. Add honeybee democracy to that list. Of books. <laughs> I mean, we're Tom okay. Seeley. <laughs> it's a great, it's a beautiful book. All right, writing it down. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> good night, everyone. Good night.